I want to go over this derivation that makes a connection between a wire and the interatomic properties of that wire. So first idea of this model, this ball and spring model of matter. It says that if I have some matter like this wire, uh, it's actually made up of atoms because it is. Uh, and those atoms are kind of like tiny masses connected by springs. And so what we want to do is to look at the properties of this wire and relate that to the spring, effective spring constant between these balls. And so that's just a model, but it works very well and it's very useful. Uh, so let's start with Young's modulus. If I want to find the properties of this wire, I actually want to find the, the bulk properties of the material. I don't really care about the size of the wire. And so if I pull on this wire I'm pulling right now, it does stretch. I mean, it doesn't stretch very much, but it, this does stretch. The thinner the wire with the same force, it's going to stretch longer. It's going to stretch more. Uh, also, the longer the wire and I stretch it, it's going to stretch more. And so how do we get rid of the, the physical size parameters of the wire? And that's with Young's modulus. Young's modulus tells us the stretchiness of this material independent of its actual dimensions. So we define Young's modulus, Y, as the stress over strain, where stress is the force applied to a wire divided by the cross-sectional area of the wire. And then we divide that by the strain, which is the, uh, the change in length delta L divided by the total length. So that's Jung's module. So this would be the same no matter what kind of wire you have, if it's on the same material. It's a property of the material. So this is, if that was an aluminum wire, which I don't even know what that kind of wire it was. I think it's nickel. That was nickel wire. Uh, then we can find properties of the nickel. Now what we want to do is to relate that to this interatomic spring constant, I'll call that Ki. That's the spring constant uh, in between masses. Now, the, we need to know something about springs first. So we have the basic version of Hooke's law that says Hooke's law. This says that if I have a spring and I apply some force F, then it's going to stretch some amount S. And the relation between those is F is K times S, where K is a spring constant. Okay. Now, what we want to look at what happens when we put springs in parallel. So if I have two springs connected together like that, that's parallel, or in series. Two in, in series, like this, so in a line. And so I actually took some pictures over here with a simple setup, and we can look at this to see the important thing here. So let me switch over to these pictures right here. So this, I have five identical springs. They're all the same, and they're all hanging with no masses on them, so they all hang about the same final distance. So this one has two in a row, so I hung it higher. Here's one by itself. Here's two together in parallel and two in series. Now what happens when I... Uh, add a weight to them. These are all 200 grams. Same spring, same mass. But you'll notice that this one, one spring stretches. So I have a force mg pulling down. So th that's the same as the spring force pulling it up, and it's in equilibrium. And so you can see the stretch distance right here. This was, I think it was uh, 12 centimeters, something like that. This one has the same force pulling down, so it has the same force pulling up. But now, each of those springs has to pull that. So each spring has only pulled uh, half of the total force. And so the stretch amount for this combination is half as much. So if this is 12, this would be 6 centimeters. It only pulled it down 6 centimeters. Okay. So if I want to treat this as one spring constant, since it doesn't stretch as much, it's kind of like double the spring constant, right? If I had a spring constant twice as much, it wouldn't stretch as much. So two springs in parallel makes a equivalent spring constant that's twice as much. If I had three springs in parallel, it would be three times as much as spring constant, the equivalent spring constant. So springs in parallel make a stronger spring. Now, you know, the picture looks a little weird in this video, but that's fine. Uh, here I have two springs in parallel, in, in series, I'm sorry, connected together. Now, this spring, this bottom spring, has the total force of this pulling on it, and so it stretches an amount 6 or 12 centimeters. But this one also has the force of, 12, of 200 grams pulling on it, 
times t, sorry. Uh, so it has a stretch also of 12. So if you add those two stretches together, you get twice the stretch, 24 centimeters. So if I look at the stretch of 24 centimeters for the same spring constant, I would have to have half the, spring, the value of the spring constant. So putting these in a series decreases the effect of spring constant by an amount of the number of springs in a row. Do you like that? Okay, I took some other pictures. Um, I don't know why. I, I measured these, it was just an approximate, I did almost come out right, so I was pretty happy with that. Okay, so let's go back over to the paper. Now, the first thing that we actually need is this interatomic distance. So we want to assume a cubic lattice of atoms. So assume each atom takes up a cube and they're all butted up right next to each other. Now that's not necessarily true in most materials, but this, this derivation will work just fine with that. Um, how can you find that? Well, if I know the molar mass uh, of something, mo capital M is the molar mass, the mass per mole, and I know uh, Avogadro's number in A, uh, and I know the density uh, A number, and I know the density rho, then I can find the volume of this, right? So I know the mass of one atom, M1, one atom, is going to be the molar mass, which is the mass for a mole, M, divided by the number of atoms in a mole. And I can say that the dense, that is equal to uh, the density times the volume. So the volume, which is d cubed, rho d cubed. So d cubed, I'm, I didn't really mean to do this. d cubed is the mass of one atom over rho, and then you can find that d. Okay, so that comes up sometimes. So what we really need to do is get a new piece of paper. So here's my wire. Okay, and so it's broken into columns like this. And I'm not gonna, and I guess a bunch of atoms, you get the idea. And it's broken in this way and this way like that, okay. And this has a length L, and there's some force applied to it, F. It has an area A, and it's gonna stretch an amount delta L. Now, what I want to do is to find out the following. How many, you'll notice that in this picture, I have nine uh, atoms at the top surface. And so nine atoms means I'm going to have nine rows of springs. So I need to find the number of rows of springs, NR. That's the number of rows. I also need the number of bonds in each individual string. So I need the number of bonds, number of bonds in a row. in a row. Sorry about that. Okay, so now let's just start with um, a Young's modulus, which say I know Young's modulus. That's going to be F over A over delta L over L. And I can just write that as F L over A delta L just by making that a proper fraction. Now if I want to write the area, the area of this cross-sectional area, A is going to be equal to the number of rows, right, times uh, D squared. Because each one of these has an area of D squared, the number of rows tells me how many atoms are in the top, so I get that. The length is going to be equal to uh, the number of bonds in a row times D. Each one of these is D, and if I know how many there are, so it's going to be number of bonds times D. Uh, and then F is my applied force. It's going to be equal to uh, K delta L, right? The, and this is the K wire. That's the, the whole spring. This wire is a spring. So it's K wire times delta L. That's from Hooke's Law. So if I put all this together, I get Y equals the force K wire delta L. That's the stretch amount. Uh, that's force times L 
over the area, which is going to be, oh, I'm sorry, L is going to be equal to number of bonds times D, and this is going to be equal to the area, the number of rows times D squared, and then delta L. The delta L cancels, so I get K wire, number of bonds times D over number of rows times D squared. Now I need to get the K of wire in terms of uh, the interatomic spring constant. So K wire, we already said, how many rows do I have in, in this thing, right? So I have, uh, the number of rows I have will be in R times, no, I'm sorry. It's gonna be equal to uh, K interatomic over, I always get this wrong, number of rows. Is that right? So if I have three rows, three of these rows, let's just say I have three, then the effective spring constant will be three times as much, not a third, right? Because it's gonna stretch less. So this should be K is like this in R, number of rows times that. And then I need to divide by the number of bonds, right? Because that's going to make the spring constant weaker. Yeah, that's right. So if I put that in, now I get Y equals the K wire, which is K I N R over N B times N B over N R times one over D because those cancel. And so I get what I'm looking for. Y is K I over D. It's really a big deal, right? Because this says the Young's modulus is a property that we can measure of the wire. That's the interatomic spring constant, and that's the diameter of an atom. And there you go. That's the connection. I have to derive this because I always get this little, this N, R, N, B mi mixed up, um, even though I understand how it works. So that's that. That's how that works. Hope that's helpful.